Welcome to our review of Garth Nix's Clario. Um, this is a series that we have loved for a very long time. She introduced it to me back in high school mm -hmm. all those years ago. Um, and then I read it and I loved it. And then she kind of handed me this short story anthology which had a prequel or an after story to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then shortly after that, she tells me that, oh, you know, he's writing a story about um, Chlor of the Mask. And I'm like, ew, I don't remember that character at all. And then I go look it up and she's this... Um, she appears in Lariel. Just for like a little bit. Yeah, she is drawn from the north from the forest of the north because Oren is the destroyer is rising and all the free magic creatures are being drawn to him because he's so powerful. And I was always really interested in her because I'm like, okay, I love characters with masks. <laughs> There's something really cool about masks. And I was just like, okay, I'm so excited. This is gonna be awesome. I can't wait to read this book. And then years and years came by, and I would be like, oh, is it going to come out yet? And it's just like, oh, he's working on it. But there's <laughs> other books that he's written in this span. It's coming. Totally. It's totally coming. And then we kind of forgot about it for probably a good five years. And then we went to Bia. And there it was. Clario coming out <laughs> soon. And we were like, I... This was everything we've ever <laughs> wanted. And finally, it was here. So we found... It came out, and we read it, mm -hmm. and it was interesting because expectations and reality were not quite matching up, unfortunately for me. So the basic plot of Clario is as such. Clario decides that she wants to live in the forest. She's lived in the forest probably for most of her life, but her parents have moved to the, uh, the capital city of Bel Belisiri. Um, the capital of the old kingdom, and uh, she just she can't take it. She just needs to leave. She has everything about everything. It's just like I need to go back to the forest because that's where I belong, and I'm going to become a borderer. The people who take care of the forest, and her family's like, no, you're not doing that. You're going to have a life here. Yeah. I mean, granted, she doesn't even give the city a chance. No, of course not. This she... is like serious teen angst. <laughs> she needs to get to the forest now. Is it going somewhere? No, it'll be there in like a year, two years, five months from now, but she needs to get there now. See, what I tried to think about when I was reading this was that we're older now. <laughs> we we don't understand that like instant gratification <laughs> level of this kind of like her her psyche. It's just like this happens that this has to happen now. It's not like the okay, well I'll do this, this, and this, and that'll eventually lead to me getting out. Like, yeah, it, she, she even says, like, she feels like that outside problems are kind of, like, going to keep her here for a yeah. while, but it doesn't, she doesn't say, like, oh, these problems are going to keep me here forever, I'm never going to be able to go back to the forest. She's just like, no, I need to get to the forest now. It's like every other sentence, they, they, it mentions the forest. Mm -hmm. And just everything is compared to the forest, everything is memories of the forest, it is just the forest. She's inter she's an interesting character in the fact that she's not interested in people. Yeah, I found that really, really refreshing. That, like, this girl has no motivation to have a romantic relationship. And I mean, this is something we talk about a lot when, it, like, the, sub the romantic subplot is either non-existent or not like, the rest of the story isn't put on hold. This is like, she like, lays down the law. She's like, I, I, I slept with a dude. Cool, I did it because I wanted to see what, like, what it was. I but. slept with him multiple times, still wasn't like, doing anything for me. And she's had chances for relationships throughout the course of the book, but she's just not interested. Nope, she's like, no, it's just like, I have other things that I want to do. And so that was refreshing to me. <laughs> it was. So anyways, there is a plot going on in the city. The king, who is like connected to all the magic that envelops the world and controls the world, and the magic is kind of... The magic is the thing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those kind of places. So anyways, the king is one of the keepers of magic. He helps things running, keep things running, and is generally a very important person in society. But he's not interested in ruling. He's old, he's tired, he's done. But the only problem is his only living successor has up and vanished too. They have no idea where. Um, and it looks like she's never coming back. 
So, um, this was something that I absolutely adored about this book because it was so different in how the structure was organized because normally in your like medieval fantasy books you have your king and even if the king's not working that well you have a regent. In this case it's the guilds. Mm. All of the guilds have like built this society and it's kind of implied that this society has only been around for like four years but it's long enough that these special rules have been started to put in place like the hierarchy of which guild is better than which and how low you bow to a specific member of this guild and if you're of this guild you wear this color with this color <laughs> and it's just I love that oh god just this the world building in terms of just what they wear is awesome because in Clario um, or in Sabriel and Lyro, they all wear like surcoats over, I guess, their armor, or over whatever. And the Aberstons was always like a blue, like I think royal blue with silver keys on it. And then there's like a remembrance or robe. Mm -hmm. And there's like specific robes for specific people. But now we've kind of expanded it so that now it incorporates guild and all this kind of stuff. And it was just really cool to see that kind of taken mm -hmm. outward and expanded. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, Clariel is related to... Um, the king mm -hmm. very closely. Um, she's also related to the Aversons who are people There turns out they're actually like a family. Yeah, that was so weird yeah. for me because like when I was reading the, the original trilogy I always thought the Aberson was a person. There was an Aberson. That was it. They were that was who they were But in this case, it's a family. <laughs> like they're all related. They're all kind of like the Abersons and then there's one Aberson, the Aberson. And then there is the Aberson in waiting who is in case something happens to the Aberson they take over. And they're basically training to be his replacement when he either abdicates, dies, Whatever. disappears. But anyway, crazy necromancer. So Clariel is related to the Aversons and she's also kind of closely related to the king. He's She's the closest living relative. So you basically have this girl who doesn't want anything to do with anything, who has all the correct like connections to become someone very very important but she doesn't want it <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want it at all not even tempted like one of these characters comes up to her and it's like our society is screwed you can fix this and she's just like don't want to don't care moving on gotta go to the woods <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So anyways, there is a governor named Kilp. He is the master of the Gold Guild, um, which her mother is a, ma uh, a member of, and he has a son named Aronzo, and he is secretly plotting to marry Clariel off to his son so that he can gain power and kind of become permanent ruler of the city of Belisari. Um, Clariel is not interested. He needs he to get to the woods. He is such a dick. Like him and his him son. and his son. Like his son, just I have to laugh about his son <laughs> because so she goes. They're in the capital city. Her parents are like, okay, we're gonna send you the to the equivalent of finishing school so you can learn how to be a proper lady and like do something with your life. Meet people your own age, make a, a connection. Even though they've decided they've been talking with Kelp about marrying her off to his son, and so she goes to these classes. And of course, one of the best lines is her being like. I did like this class, but it wouldn't matter if it taken place in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> she literally says that. <laughs> she does. But there's this tea class, like the proper tea ceremony and the rules of serving tea and what where you sit and what can be spoken about. And this guy is in this class with her and he's just like, you're going to sit beside me. So how are you doing? You want to come over for dinner? You're totally going to come over for dinner. You don't want to come over for dinner? I'll make you come over for dinner. I can do that. Because I'm the governor's son. I'm Aranzo. So whoever is the highest ranking guild member sits at a certain spot, and then you, like, who you serve to is dependent on things, and of course everybody hates it, and it's very kind of like, oh, this is, this is new in vogue, but it's old, like, artsy, old person thing, and all, like, the young, like, hip teen kids are just like, ah, oh, this is so stupid. <laughs> Nobody's gonna use this. But anyways, so you meet characters um, throughout kind of Clarial's existence in the city. Um, one of them is Belletiel, who is her cousin, distantly, sort of. And he is obsessed with being the Aberson because the current Aberson is just useless. He only He's only interested in hunting. See, that really pissed me off. I'm like, dude, you have one of the coolest jobs in this world. You come from this really wicked, awesome bloodline, and you're just, you want to hunt animals. 
buddy, you could be out like really hunting like free magic creatures and just like that sounds like it would be more like intense than just like the pompous show of the hunt that he's he loves so much. Mm, but but no. So anyways, Beltiel is kind of befriends Clariel and they kind of have similar goals. So um, you kind of get to know him. He's just adorable. You just he's just kind of like I picture him round faced and kind of like bouncy. What breaks my heart is because you know that eventually he's just going to be broken. Like the job is going to like get to him and he's going to become sad, which is <laughs> but, yeah. But he's a great character. You also meet uh, Master Kilgren. He's fun. Um, powerful. It's great because you he gets he shows you exactly what the charter can do mm -hmm. and reminds you how awesome magic is, which Glariel has no interest in and bugged the crap out of me. She's just like, yeah, I kind of know, I kind of had a chance to learn magic, I just never picked it up. And I'm like, why? It would be so useful to, like, everything you ever wanted to do in your life. Why have you not you picked could, this like, up? You could, like, waterproof your boots. Like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> There's just so much she could have done with magic, and she's just uninterested in it. And so, basically, the first, like, half of the novel is setting up this world and Kilp and his power and then everything really really takes off she goes to visit the king she realizes she yells at the king it's hilariously <laughs> awful and, because she's like do your job and he's like no you can't make me <laughs> that was pretty much That's the end of it and so then after that her family is going over to Kilp's for dinner and it's just like oh he's not going to do anything no 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 we're such like my mom's so important no 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 and I'm just sitting there just being like Yep. This is gonna go badly. This is gonna go so badly, and it does go badly because Clariel's mother realizes that Ronzo's piece that he made to present to the guild to be accepted as a member of the Goldsmith Guild, he didn't make himself. It was created by a free magic creature, and so then dinner becomes this crazy fight scene where both of her parents are slaughtered. <laughs> it was just like, and you're like, whoa, 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 like. And she runs, and she's trying to run to get to uh, Master Kilgren's house, but I like that they caught her. Yeah. Like, because it's normally, you know, they just get away. Ah, da, 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 da. Yeah. No, they catch her, and she's trapped. She almost gets herself out. Yeah, and that was nice, too. So, yeah, like, she had nobody come to rescue her, she would have gotten out, probably, and been okay. But somebody came to rescue her, and so she goes with them. And um, so then they're like, okay, you can't stay here, we can't send you to the forest, we can't send you to your aunt, because, like, they're going to go looking for your aunt. Why don't we send you to the Abhorsons? They this can. is such a good idea. <laughs> and Clario's like, just, just send me to the forest. And they're like, no, go to the your, Abhorsons. Your, and she's like, fine. Um, now the thing is, um, in her previous adventures, kind of running around the city and setting up for the big scene where her family dies, um, they had actually been trying to trap a free magic creature that had been kind of terrorizing the city. And um, the they, they do. But the thing is, they trapped it in a bottle, and Clario comes in contact with it. And so it's kind of started to, like, eat away at her mind. She feels kind of sorry for this creature who's going to be, like, trapped away for all eternity. And so she encounters this creature in a bottle again, and she's very tempted to let it out. And um, they also kind of suggest that she's predisposed to free magic because she's a berserker. Oh, yeah, we totally forgot about yeah. that. Think um, of like a Viking berserker. Well, that is basically like her. When she gets angry, her rage just goes it's out like of Incredible control. Hulk. Yeah, and it's kind of free magicy. They say so. Her combined with like coming in contact with this free magic creature causes a big problem. So, anyways, off she goes to her uncle's. Uh, yep. Yeah. And so isn't no, he's a grandfather. No, oh, goes to her grandfather. And her mother's father. And he's just like, yeah, we'll just like stick you in the old Porson's house because they. Living in the uh, Porson's house, which is amazing, I love this house, <laughs> is too problematic for these people because they want to go on hunts all the time. And so if you're living in the bottom of like this crazy waterfall thing or... The Aberson's house is, I, I picture it on the top of the waterfall. Yeah, it's on the top because there's stuff underneath. But it's like, think of like Niagara Falls. And like, there's... Picture Niagara Falls and there is an island <laughs> smack dab in the middle. <laughs> And it is, like, very difficult to get to. And the reason it's in the middle of this island is because the dead can't cross running water. And this is, like, a super powerful stream. So, therefore, they are protected from attacks from dead things. Um, and so she basically gets locked in this house. <laughs> and, of course, she's extremely pissed off. If I were in her, pit, in her place, I would 
this would have been the best thing ever for me. I would have been like, look at all this stuff that I could do and learn and explore. <laughs> but because she is so impressionable, Mogget! <laughs> Dear old Mogget. Is there. And the last few Abhorsons have been kind of useless. They haven't been fulfilling their roles. Mogget is this free magic creature who I always wanted to know how he gets bound to the Abhorsons. Like, what, how they finally catch him. Yeah, yeah. Me he's too. this super, super crazy powerful creature. And he's kind of slowly breaking free of some of the spells that bind him. Like, he won't be able to become, like, his true form thing, but... He can kind of do what he wants now. He's got, like, fairy level, like, I can't lie, but I can twist truth things going, going on. on. And generally they tell him, like, oh, don't leave the house, you know, you have to promise to serve me kind of thing, but because it's been so long, he's kind of breaking out of this. And so he's talking to Clariel, and he convinces her that he kind of tells her a way to escape, and that is to take the free magic creatures that are kind of buried in the basement, including the one she encountered earlier, bind them to her, and then have them take her out. This is basically the beginning of the shit show. <laughs> this is about when I was like, yeah, this is the book I signed up for. I am so pumped. Let's just destroy everything we love. Go, go, go. And like, she she frees these two creatures, like the one, the original one and this other one. And like, I love, I love how he describes these creatures. And I just, I love the way he describes this world. And then it just becomes this just crazy, just like everything that should have been happened well paced throughout the book just starts like slapping you in the face. <laughs> and I kind of get why he did it because he wants to show that Clariel's making really, really bad decisions and she's not really thinking them through. So it's just like, bam, 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 bam. Crap, this is the only way out. Crap, I'm stuck. Crap, what do I do? Ha, ah, ah, ha, ah. <laughs> ha. Basically, it's her. And so, like, she binds these two free magic creatures to her. And as she uses free magic, her grip on the charter starts to fade. And the charter is, like, very important. Like, you're either in the charter or you're not. And she's wearing this mask and, to, like, like, protect. and this gear to, yeah, protect herself from the free magic. But it's the spell is slowly starting to fade. And she's finding it harder and harder to take off this mask. And that was cool. Like, she, they escape. And she's like, oh, fuck, I gotta get, get this stuff off. And she can't take the mask off. And I'm just like, this is what I wanted. <laughs> it, it, for me, it was just like 200 pages of eh. And then 100 pages of this is what I signed up for. This is everything I've ever wanted. Yes, yes, give this to me. Um, so she realizes she has to arm herself because she's going to take Kilp, who's kind of like got the the basically she's under just stage. like he killed my parents. I'm gonna kill him. Yep, and he's <laughs> like kind of made his move. He's captured the king. So she's like, okay, this it's it's time. He needs to get out of here. And now. so so what does she do? She takes her two free magic creatures. They merge into one mm -hmm. and become a dragon. And I'm just like. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> this is so awesome! Um, she's also taken Mogget with yeah. her. And so they're heading for this kingdom. They stop in a barrow to find a sword. And that was probably like one of the best written creepy scenes. <laughs> because they're like, oh, you need a sword. Oh, we can make you a sword. Or, you know, there's this super cool special <laughs> sword that we know of that's totally just like chilling. We should totally go get it. it let's, let's do it. <laughs> and so she goes into this cave and there's a sword and then there are some necromancer free magic bells and she's and none... like <laughs> and you're like yes just take the bells come on descend become a bad person <laughs> and like i how he writ that wrote that scene like her like internal struggle with like taking the bells i think was really yeah that was really well done because she's like no but she has but no <laughs> I mean, she find she actually does not take the bells. I was kind of surprised. I was totally shocked, and that's kind of when I started to realize that this book was not going to give me what I wanted. <laughs> that was when I started to see that there are only seventy five pages left, and she's nowhere near where she needs to be to become Claw of the Mask. So, she takes her creepy dragon monster thing, arrives at the capital mm. at the castle, and she's like, "Don't kill anybody, guys." <laughs> don't kill anyone and so of course at this point her control over her two uh minions is really starting to slip 
<laughs> and she just like loses it. <laughs> and then off they go, destroying everyone. And so one of the best moments, there are so many best moments in the last part of this book, but they arrive into the throne room and there's Kilp and there's his son and there's the king and he's freaking out and there's this crazy battle happening and these two free magic creatures just like descend into this room and just murder everyone. <laughs> and Kilp and his son are just like, oh crap. Uh, <laughs> Dad, I, did you? <laughs> I didn't sign up for this. I want out now. <laughs> and then... She kills Aronzo. Just blood. Full blood. Just yeah. like, and then Kilp is just like, what? And she's like, who are you? Take off your mask. No, no, no. And she's just like, oh, you killed my family. How many families have you killed that you don't know who I am? And you're just like. And then she kills him too, and then she's just kind of standing there and they're dead, and she's just like, well, that didn't help anything. <laughs> <laughs> now what am I supposed to do with my life? And so the creatures have kind of broken free of her control, and now it kind of reveals why they kind of followed her and they agreed to come with her, because down in the below this palace is this kind of great charter stone, one of the big keys to charter magic and keeping it working, and the royalty is supposed to keep it safe, but now these creatures are in the palace, and they are going for the charter. Um, Mogget reveals his true colors and is like, yeah, this is what I wanted all along. I'm off to destroy the charter now. And, and she's, she's, she's just like, I'm, I'm gonna die. This is it. <laughs> I, I can't stop them anymore. And she can't take off the mask and she's just slowly slipping. And then in comes Beltiel. And he ends up helping defeat the free magic creatures because he is now the Aberson. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the current Aberson, her grandfather, fell off his horse and broke his neck. It very conveniently at the right time. So Bellatiel could now go in and save Clariel. And he's now the Aberson in waiting because he didn't know he was the Aberson in waiting because the real Aberson in waiting. I don't even know. See, I had a problem with that because that was just so convenient. I like. What would have been cool in my mind is that the Aberson in waiting is not more of a. It's not really a title. It's more of a. Thing because he was fulfilling the role, he was teaching himself this stuff, he was investigating, he was clearly hell-bent on taking this position and fulfilling this role. Okay, I can I can justify that as him being the true Abhorson and waiting. I can even justify it further in the fact that the Abhorson isn't doing his job, so maybe in, by doing that he's somehow abdicated the position. That would be Because now, now the role is needed, and so the one person who's going to fulfill it is called to the, the spot, like the role. That's Fine. how I would have so like, this just seems too just like... How did he fall off his horse, Beltio? Did you push him? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, why? Why now? This guy has been out in the forest for days at a time, in and out, in and out, on different horses, and he falls off now? And so basically he comes in. He looks at Mogget and he's like, I, uh... I bind you again. I rebind you to all your previous oaths. And Mogget's just like, oh, damn it. <laughs> Fuck. And then he looks at Clariel and he's like, oh, what did you do? And she's dying. And so they end up taking her down to the Charter Stone and kind of reconnecting her to the Charter. But they can't really totally reconnect her to it because she's so corrupted by free magic, they kind of like... Just cut her off from magic in general. Find her, like, free magicness so that she can't access it anymore. And she's basically like, to, she says to him, like, why didn't you just let me die? Well, that would have been kinder. Because you know I'm going to do this. I am going to give in. I'm craving this power, and eventually I'm not going to be strong enough. And he's like, yeah, it's, it's okay, okay, buddy. You're bound. <laughs> it's okay. You'll never access it again. We're going to ship you off, 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 off to a forest, forest now. It's great. And we can't really send you to your forest, but there's this really cool one that's really far north, and I think you'll love it there. <laughs> <laughs> so they kind of just ship her off to the farm. But my fate, like, the one thing about that that I did really like was Moggett's just kind of like, hey, hey, you know, you totally shouldn't have listened to me. <laughs> By the way, did you know that if you go far north enough, charter magic stops having an effect? So hey, guess what? That free magic in the middle of your, like, soul? It's gonna be free. free. Have, Have fun. fun. Oh, you're gonna still go? Cool. Have fun. You're just like... 
Where was my fall? Where well, I kind of see it as the fall has happened. Now we just, like... No, because... She's already fallen. She's already corrupted. She's corrupted, but she kind of hasn't embraced it yet. She's But she has no will to fight it anymore. She full-on said, yeah, I've had, I'm, I'm going to want to become a necromancer. I'm going to want to have some bells. I'm going to want to stir up shit. But she's never... Like... Okay, so she's corrupted, but she hasn't corrupted fully. She's not, like, embraced her corruptedness, right? And I feel like that's the ultimate moment. Like, because if you're just like, okay, I'm corrupted, I've done bad things, there's still kind of that chance of redemption. You're like, okay, I'm corrupted, I can do bad, I've done bad things, but, you know, maybe I can do some good in there. And it's that moment when you're like, fuck it, but she, all my morals. She never been- says, I'm going to try and do some good. She's just like, yeah, I'm broken. I'm just going to let myself keep breaking. Yeah. No, that's not enough for me. She she hasn't embraced it yet. Like, that's the thing, right? She's just kind of like, I'm broken. I can't do this anymore. But she hasn't... She hasn't taken joy in her breaking yet. She's... she, Like that moment where you're like, Hey, I'm broken. This is great. I am just gonna do whatever I want and stop trying. You know what I mean? The way I see it is she's gonna go off into this special, super secret, far up north forest where... Charter magic doesn't rain anymore, and there are free magic creatures running around. She's going to be there for like five minutes. Some free magic creature's going to be like, hey, look, a snack. And she's going to be like, hey, look, a snack. (laughs) That's how I kind of see it going. And she's just going to spend, I don't know, is it 2,000 years? Are we 2,000 years ahead or 200? 600. Well, however many years, she's just going to sit there in that forest just eating free magic creatures. Yeah. Just like, and build herself some bells out of bones. Yeah. Because she's creepy. See, the last 100 pages, you're, you're right, were fine. Like, they were perfect. They were what you wanted. But there was not enough before or after to kind of keep me feeling satisfied. Well, we didn't talk about the prologue. The prologue was, was also pretty awesome. Yeah, but the prologue has very little to do with anything. But it was still awesome. It was awesome. I love the way the charter is described like i love how it kind of exists it's not really like speaking charter marks you name them like when you say them they freaking come out of your mouth like i always Mm -hmm. think of like the medieval paintings (laughs) where they're so stylized that you know like the ribbons come out of people's mouths saying things like yeah like you kind of see them like your breath in Mm -hmm. the air on a cold day right Mm -hmm. Um, and if you kind of, it's kind of like if you screwed up your eyes, you'd see everything's kind of made up of, like, writing, mm-hmm. right? Like, everything is made up, like, the Matrix-esque mm-hmm. kind of thing. Like, <laughs> I love how just off the wall this world is, just how different it feels from so many other fantasy novels that I've read. I mean, you've pointed out to me, too, and it's something I kind of internalized, but I didn't actually think about, was the fact that there is no gender hierarchy. Oh, yeah, that was, like, the best thing. Yeah. Like, oh, we're talking to this guard, the guard's a woman. Oh, we're talking to this maid, the maid's a dude. Like, there's no, like, specific gender roles. Anyone can be anything. Yeah, and, you know, Clariel kind of takes her mother's name, but you kind of get the sense that you kind of take whoever's whichever parent's name that's higher in society kind of thing. So her mother was... The dominant one. When ...in her family, so she took her mother's name, but had her father been dominant, that's probably whose name she would have taken, right? So it's very interesting that way, and you kind of have to look at it very closely, but it's there, and it's just so refreshing. Mm-hmm. That's what this world is. It's refreshing. And even if the story isn't exactly what you want, it's worth a read just to go back there and kind of remember exactly why you loved the series. There's something else I wanted to talk about. Oh, that game. Yeah? I said, oh, that game. What game? Oh, the game of wanting to talk about something. Um, Oh, the one thing about this book that I kind of wish it did was at the beginning of Sabriel, the old kingdom is so screwed up. Like, the capital city has been abandoned because it's just full of dead just everywhere, just hundreds of them. I want to know what happened. Yeah. That's like, I know that two, 600 years before, we're not going to really technically get that story, but I kind of want to know what the downfall of the capital is, the downfall, like the downfall of the, uh, the line, like the king's line, How what happened to all the <laughs> abortions that there's just one left. Yeah. Like, um... 
I feel like he could have hinted at it, right? Some turmoil that's kind of just starting. starting. Because, I mean, Tassiel comes back, right? Mm -hmm. and so she's now the monarch, and you assume that they're just going to go on a... What I really, really wanted was because when the king's dying, they tell the king that his daughter has come back to take the throne. And I'm just like, I wish that she didn't. I wish that was just <laughs> something that they told him so that he could, like, die happily. Like, you know, be kind of relieved. But no, she's she's back, and it's funny, because she's just like, yeah, I want to kill Clariel. <laughs> to Clariel! And I'm like, well, she kind of did more for this than you ever did. And you were, you kind of just, like, chilled up with Clara for a while. Thanks. And, like, the king keeps having, he talks about this dream that he had of his daughter standing oh, on yeah. the battlements of the city in, like, full armor. And I'm just like, what's that from? Like... Yeah. Is this the downfall? Is this the beginning of the downfall? Come on, tell me this stuff. Tell me this stuff, and that, next. And that vision never kind of comes mm -hmm. into fruition. It's just kind of like ignored at the end, right? Like, she, Tassiel never stands at the at, mm -hmm. on the wall of her city going, hey, I'm back, or Woo! anything like that. That's not what it was. It's just, oh yeah, I had this vision, and... Anyway. So there's a lot we still want. <laughs> Uh, he could write the series forever for me. I'd be yeah, I'd very be happy. So happy. Just keep bringing them, please. Um, I hope we don't have to wait as long for the next one because I think I will cry. <laughs> and I will be 30. So. 35, actually. So. That's almost 40. <laughs> yeah. No. I can't deal with another 10 years. <laughs> No more. Definitely <laughs> want, makes me want to go back and reread the original trilogy. Oh, I because, agree. Because, like, they were so close to my heart. Like, there were so many firsts with these books. Like, they were my first real dark fantasy, like medieval fantasy. They were my first, like, introduction to, like, necromancy. And that became, like, this ongoing theme in books that I've read to this day. It was just... A different way to do magic. Just, like... It, yeah, it was just so abstract and so mm -hmm. different from kind of the formulas that you're used to that you got really excited. Mm -hmm. And when I was a girl guide, this oh, no. is kind of funny. When we were at camp, there was like a a week that was like magic themed, like fantasy <laughs> themed, and so my friends and I we drew charter marks on our foreheads. <laughs> there are pictures of me with like char a charter mark on my forehead. <laughs> yeah, that was me. There are also kids running around with Harry Potter scars, so there you go. <laughs> Alright, so that was our spoiler-filled review of Clario and all that we felt and emoted over in this. So we hope to see you guys again. And if you have read Clario or Sabriel or any of Garth Nix's ilk, please tell us what you think about it and which one was your favorite and why you loved it. How long have you been waiting for this book? That's my question. You realize that there were people who hadn't been born that are probably reading it right now? Yeah. God. It's terrifying. Bye, guys.